episode 581, Jake as Mentor. After seeing Cornelius and Charles off, Jake returned to the living room and sat directly opposite Horace. He wore a relaxed expression and said in a friendly tone, Horace, it looks like it hasn't quite set in that your life is about to change dramatically. Jake, to be honest, it still feels like I'm dreaming. I'm having a hard time accepting the reality of what happened today, Horace admitted. Since only Jake and Rick were present with him at this point, Horace was beginning to relax, and some of the colors were returning to his face. A dream? Ha! Jake exclaimed before he began to laugh uncontrollably. Indeed, when he thought about what he had gone through this day, from Michael's pressure to the behavior of the outer clan elders to the ambitions of the core elders, he could not help but conclude that this experience had been even more trying than his time in the third level of the Blood Demon's secret realm. But now that the three youths had some privacy, they could finally relax a little and even share a few laughs. Horace, first of all, I want to say sorry, Jake continued, now standing up. No, Jake, you don't need to apologize. What happened today is my father's fault. It has nothing to do with you, Horace immediately protested. On the other hand, he was rather taken aback by Jake's humbleness, as the peerless genius never apologized, so he wanted to relieve the tension in the room. Jake commented, Horace, you must accept my apology. Amid the competition for power and profit, the head-on conflict between me and your father put you in a dilemma. It's my fault. Seeing that Horace was about to repeat his protest, Jake motioned for him to hold his words, then continued, Horace, do you know why I recommended you as the first king of the Hampton State? Jake, to be honest, I don't know. I can't figure it out, Horace said, shaking his head with a puzzled expression on his face. He paused for a moment and thought, and then went on. If your decision had been based on fraternal love, then surely you would have chosen Rick, as you are much closer to him than I. And if your decision had been based on talent, then surely you would have chosen Arthur, who has outstanding comprehension ability. Jake didn't know who this Arthur person was, but seeing that Horace was genuinely concerned, he let him continue his discourse. Yet once he began to feel they were wasting time, he intervened, explaining... I recommended you as the first king for two reasons. The first reason was, indeed, the brotherhood between us. The king will control the lifeline and resources of the state, so why wouldn't I want someone I'm close to in this position? Jake could sense that Horace was anxious to redirect attention to Rick at this point, so he hurriedly proceeded explaining. The second reason is that I admire your qualifications and talents. You must know that it's not an easy task to lead a kingdom. One must choose good advisors who can help manage the government so that you can take on the role of overseer. If you choose the wrong person, the results could be deadly, but I trust your judgment based on your personality. Jake, what do you think I should do? Horace asked in an urgent tone. Indeed, Jake's explanation had been too spare, and he still had pressing questions about how best to conduct good government. Horace, did you notice that I asked Cornelius and Charles to keep a close eye on you just now? I want them to guide your decision-making and assure that you don't end up in trouble. Seeing that his logical explanations were not winning Horace over, Jake changed gears and began to focus on instilling a sense of loyalty in the future king. Horace, I'm going to give you a goal. In three months, I want you to not only have become a qualified monarch, but also to have broken through to the body-refining stage. What do you think? Whoa, said Horace, sensing the difficulty of the goals Jake had set out. Since Horus was already at the Great Perfection 10th level of the energy refining period, it would not be too difficult for him to break through to the next stage as long as he had an opportunity to accumulate a sufficient amount of spiritual power. However, this was not the only ingredient in such a breakthrough. One also needed sufficient time to practice, and surely time would be in short supply once Horus assumed the position of monarch. Jake sensed his doubt and intervened, explaining, Horus, being the leader of a country is also a process of cultivation. Once you assume your new role, your cultivation will naturally begin to accelerate in speed. Then, Jake took out two jade boxes and a pill bottle from his storage bag and set them before Horus. He explained, Horus, here is an amethyst root, a bleeding heart fruit, and a level 7 pill that will help you improve your cultivation talent. Once you have consumed them, I'm confident you will be able to break through to the body refining stage within three months. Nice. Horace exclaimed. Unlike Michael and Cornelius, who had initially been overpolite in the face of Jake's generous gifts and gestured to refuse them, Horace simply snatched the items, put them in his storage bag, and gave Jake a big smile. 
Okay, Jake expressed, happy to see this level of confidence in Horace. Then he put forward a second request, explaining, I also want you to break through to the energy transforming stage within three years. What do you think? Initially, Jake had planned to stay out of family advancement affairs as much as possible, now that the important work of setting forth a blueprint for the Hampton family's future was complete. But as he considered the likelihood that he would be present in the Hampton country less and less frequently in the coming years, focused instead on his cultivation in the Floating Cloud sect, he thought it best to set up a strong future for Horace now. Indeed, he would help his clan brother directly in breaking through to the energy-transforming stage. Episode 582 The New Leader's Gift Horace reacted to Jake's challenge by declaring, Jake, don't joke with me. Don't say it will only take me three years. Even if given five or ten years, I don't know that I'll be able to break through to the energy-transforming stage. Horace didn't feel any embarrassment at not being able to reach this benchmark. Rather, he just dismissed it out of hand. Jake countered, Horace, if in three years you have reached the Great Perfection 10th level of the body refining stage, I will give you pills that can improve your cultivation talent and spirit fruits that will assure your breakthrough to the energy transforming stage. He hoped that these words would serve as a source of encouragement to Horace, inspiring him to work harder at his cultivation. Really? Horace exclaimed. Yes, as long as you can reach the very top of the body refining stage, I can give you the necessary treasures. Just leave it all to me. Jake assured him. I will try my best to reach this goal, Horace proclaimed with his fists clenched. Jake took a deep breath, then shifted gears, commenting, Horace, if you want to adapt to the monarch's life as soon as possible so that you can concentrate on your cultivation, I suggest you go to your father for advice. He was a patriarch for more than ten years, and he has been dealing with the royal family of the Vill Country for decades. He will no doubt have invaluable insight for you. Okay? Then I will bid you farewell, Rick and Jake, Horace quickly offered. Jake simply raised his teacup in response. He hadn't meant to send Horace off so abruptly, but now that he was leaving of his own volition, he could turn his attention to Rick. Jake and Rick had a closer relationship, so they felt they could be more informal with each other. Jake opened the conversation by joking, So, Rick, are you pissed at me for giving Horace the throne and you the family patriarch position? I defer to your judgment, said Rick in an ultra-respectful tone. Jake immediately shot back. Rick, you are now the patriarch of the Hampton family. Your position is that of a nobleman. You don't have to address me with such formality from now on. He motioned for Rick to sit down and attempted to stoke his confidence. Jake, whether I am a patriarch or just a normal member of the young generation, you will always be my master. I will be forever in your debt, Rick solemnly declared. Jake continued. Rick... In the family assembly hall, Cornelius asked me about the difference between the Hampton family and the Hampton state. At that point, I said that the Hampton family is the root, and the Hampton state is the foundation. In my estimation, roots are far stronger than a foundation. Without them, where would a foundation come from in the first place? What I mean is, your position might not technically be as elevated as Horace's, but in my heart, I hold it in higher regard. Jake, I appreciate your heartfelt sentiment. Rick was moved to declare. Jake offered, Rick, you know me well, and you know my goals. I will likely be present in Hampton State less and less in the future, so my question is how can I ensure my enduring influence in my physical absence? You are the key to this, and that is the real reason I chose you as clan leader. Rick stood up, and in a solemn tone, queried, Jake, can you clarify what you mean by this? Jake cut straight to the point, explaining, My concern is for the young generation, they might not know me well, but I want them to be aware of me. I want them to remember me as they grow older. You are the key to this. Rick reassured him. Don't worry. I will make sure the newbies grow up admiring you and well aware of all you have done for this family. Seeing that Rick had understood his thinking, Jake nodded, then took out two boxes and a pill bottle from the storage bag and pushed them to Rick. He expounded, Rick, I'm offering you the same treasures I offered Horace. Use them in good health. And remember, in the Eternal Continent, strength is the prerequisite of gaining respect. I will do you justice, Jake, Rick vowed. You have my word. Jake proceeded to take out another box and two pill bottles and place them before Rick. He went on, I will likely be gone for some years once I am done handling family affairs here, so I must leave you and Horace enough treasures that you can improve your cultivation bases to the max. 
Jake then opened the box and explained, Rick, this is a bleeding heart fruit, which is a seventh level spirit fruit that can aid you in breaking through to the energy transforming stage. When you have reached the great perfection tenth level of the body refining stage, consume this fruit at once. Do you hear me? Master Jake, this is too precious, Rick demurred. Though Rick had heard of the existence of spirit fruits that could help a warrior break through to the energy transforming stage, he had never dreamed of seeing one in person, much less having one in his possession. He was truly overwhelmed by the experience, and his breathing became heavy as he trembled. It's just a spirit fruit, Jake commented. Please, calm yourself. Then he took out a pill bottle, poured out one of the pills, and said, This is an energy condensation pill which can accelerate the transformation of spiritual energy into the vital spirit and make you break through and consolidate your accomplishments in the energy transforming period. Episode 583 Jake's Next Step Seeing Rick's shocked expression on the face of the energy condensation pill, Jake could not help but anticipate his response to the next treasure he was offering him. After a dramatic pause, he explained, Rick, this is a lower level 7 celestial sphere pill. Its function is simple. It can improve your cultivation talent as long as your talent level is below the 6th grade. A pill that can improve cultivation talent, Rick exclaimed. He had heard from his peers about bodiless pills, which had the same function as this one. But this was his first time hearing about the Celestial Sphere pill. He almost fainted with excitement. Yet without skipping a beat, Jake proceeded, explaining, Rick, I am giving you these treasures for safekeeping, but in the future they are meant to be shared by you and Horus. Once Horus, too, has reached the Great Perfection 10th level of the Body Refining Period, I will expect you to transfer his share of the treasures to him. Master Jake, I will remember, Rick declared as he put the boxes and pill bottles into his storage bag. Jake cleared his throat, then cautioned in a grave tone, Rick, these spirit fruits, spirit roots, and pills are precious treasures by any standard. They are likely to arouse the greed of others. Thus, you must refrain from mentioning that you possess them. Otherwise, even Cornelius will not be able to protect you from attacks. After all, given his own experiences with top cultivation throughout various domains, Jake knew firsthand the temptation that precious treasures posed to warriors. He wanted these resources to be put to use, but the last thing he wanted was for them to put Horus or Rick in danger. Young Patriarch, even to my father I won't reveal the full nature of your gifts, Rick vowed, nodding vigorously. As he spoke, he put his hand solemnly on his chest. Jake then waved his hand and signaled that Rick could leave, declaring, Well, it's getting late. Go back to your quarters and have a rest. Jake sighed. Now it was in Rick's and Horace's hands. He couldn't really do much more to assure their success. As soon as Rick had departed, Alwyn interrupted Jake's plans to return to his bedroom and rest, querying him, Kid, the troubles of the Hampton family seem to be under control, so what's your plan? Jake explained, Elder Alwyn, when I won first place in the Floating Cloud Sect Outer Sect competition, my reward consisted not only of spirit stones and pills, but also the opportunity to enter the Heavenly Void secret realm for three days, so I need to prepare. What? The Heavenly Void secret realm? Alwyn blurted. In his mind, Jake could feel the Elder becoming agitated. Yes, it was by far the most coveted of the rewards, Jake commented. Throughout the Southern Domain, the Heavenly Void secret realm was known as a mysterious place that was mostly confined to legend. Yet to the peerless geniuses of the nine major powers, it was a key training ground that carried the potential to substantially improve a warrior's cultivation. Thus, peerless geniuses considered it a rare and coveted opportunity. Kid, I want to enter the Heavenly Void secret realm with you, Alwyn declared. The elder's tone was resolute, but Jake reacted with some hesitation, for based on Bartleby's explanation, Jake knew that the Heavenly Void secret realm offered the potential for rebirth but this was premised on a martial artist being below the Divine Soul period. Jake knew that Alwyn's cultivation had definitely exceeded the Divine Soul stage, and had likely reached the Supreme stage, so it was unclear what benefits he could reap from this secret realm. Jake ventured, Old Alwyn, if you want to accompany me, I don't see any problem with it, but I don't know the specific situation of this opening of the secret realm, and I'm afraid it will be difficult for my mentor to give me detailed information about how this particular realm is managed. The last thing Jake wanted to do was deter Alwyn, for he knew that with the Elder's mastery of formations and rich experience, he would no doubt bring unimaginable benefits during the three days of exploration. 
On the other hand, Bartleby had sternly warned Jake that since the Heavenly Void secret realm was one of the top ten secret realms in the Southern Domain, it tended to be opened by one of the most powerful experts in the Eternal Continent, and Jake had no idea whether Alwyn would be able to successfully hide from such a peerless genius. Moreover, he had no idea whether there would be some sort of prohibition against his entering the secret realm with a supreme stage genius like Alwyn in his mind. Yet Alwyn assured him, Kid, as long as you agree to take me in, trust me, I have my ways of avoiding detection from the secret realm administrators, even if they are at the supreme stage. At the same time, Alwyn knew that in the context of this secret realm, Jake would not be able to depend on the same level of security and privilege he enjoyed in the Floating Cloud Sect. Thus, before they entered the realm, Alwyn had to find a way to fully integrate his spirit body into Jake's consciousness. Only when he had fully integrated could he ensure that he would avoid detection by the peerless geniuses overseeing the secret realm. Okay, Elder Alwyn, if you have a way of avoiding the surveillance of these strongmen, I don't see a problem with you accompanying me, Jake relented. He was confident that Alwyn knew what he was talking about. Hearing only silence from the Elder, he continued, If there's nothing else, Elder Alwyn, then I think I'll have a rest. Though Jake's tone was casual, he was desperately tired, and could not help but hope that Alwyn would simply let him go at this point. You go and have a rest. I'm going to start thinking about how to deceive the guardians of the Heavenly Void secret realm, Alwyn offered. Jake shook his head, amused by Alwyn's toughness, but didn't say anything more. He walked back to his bedroom and immediately fell asleep. Episode 584 A Figure in Brentwood Fifty years ago, what was before one larger territory was divided into the Ville Country and the McGregor Country, and at that point, a genius emerged from the royal family of the McGregor Country. This genius was Enrique. When his cultivation talent was tested at the age of 16, he was shown to have quite remarkably already reached the lower seventh level. That year he reached the energy refining stage, and about one year later he broke through to the body refining stage. Eleven years and seven months later, he had reached the energy transforming stage. At the same time, he also displayed extraordinary wisdom and a grasp of the political situation of his kingdom, under the leadership of Enrique, the royal family consolidated their powers in the McGregor country and quashed competing families. And indeed, twenty years ago, just as he had reached the seventh level of the energy transforming stage, he had successfully repressed an uprising by Harrington family forces in the McGregor country and unified the state of McGregor, thus becoming the state's true overlord. And now, after two decades of development, the overall strength of the kingdom had shot up dramatically and now it was one of the most powerful among those affiliated with the Heavenly Dragon Emperor. Further, Brentwood, the capital city of the McGregor country, is far more prosperous than the destroyed city of Morris. In its center stands a magnificent building complex covering an area of hundreds of thousands of square feet. This complex forms a monumentally scaled courtyard house, which includes rockers and pools, a five-mile-long corridor, a ten-mile pavilion, elaborate cornices, ornate gardens, beautiful blue tiles, and a stream. It is known as the Royal Palace, and it symbolizes far and wide the undisputable power of the McGregor State and the McGregor family. This magnificent architectural complex is the Royal Palace, symbolizing the orthodoxy of the Yan State and the residence of the Yan family. In front of the palace, a young man dressed in light blue clothes was standing with a faint smile on his face and a calm temperament. The sight was unusual, as typically one only spotted members of the royal family and civil and military officials in the vicinity of this important structure. Further, there was something about this boy's easy confidence that reassured the palace guards, and so, surprisingly, they did not immediately drive him away. After standing and observing the impressive architecture for a few moments, the boy walked toward the front gate, and at that point, the head guard had no choice but to intervene. He boomed. The royal palace is an important place. No one is allowed to approach. I'm looking for someone, the boy in blue explained in a gentle tone, still smiling his gentle smile. Looking for someone, I see, the head guard mused. Due to the boy's noble temperament and top-quality silk garments, the guard could tell his origins were extraordinary. He thus did not want to risk offending him by driving him away. The guard continued, Who are you looking for? I'm looking for Enrique, the strongest man in the McGregor state. 
the boy in blue stated in a confident and straightforward tone. That is a bold request. I'm shocked you would submit it without preamble, the guard shot back. His expression had hardened, and his tone was now tinged with anger. The situation of Enrique was quite different from that of Cornelius, who essentially hid in the medicinal field and rarely appeared in the Hampton family compound. Indeed, even some of the members of the Hampton family's main line did not know of Cornelius at all. On the other hand, Enrique was known and respected by every single citizen of the McGregor state, and all knew that he was singularly responsible for uniting the state, stabilizing it, and allowing it to flourish. Huh, the boy in blue chuckled. Looking around at these digs, it appears that honesty is not a prerequisite of success. Even a person who does not pay his debts can be treated as a god. Kid, you're courting death, the head guard spat in the face of the boy's insults toward Enrique. At the same time, the group of eight guards at the front gate took out their weapons and began to rush toward the boy. Alas, too impulsive, too rash, the boy in blue muttered. Then he simply glared at the approaching guards, all of them at the body refining stage, and shook his head. With a sigh, he deployed a series of attacks that laid the guards low within seconds, and then muttered again, Hardly worth the effort. What a joke. He looked up at the copper gates in front of him, and a cold light passed through his eyes. He took out his spirit knife and summoned his strength. Then, crouching down, he leapt up, and like a giant bird, he began to soar through the sky, ten feet above the ground. At the same time, he shouted, Sun Scorcher! Boom! With the power gathered on the spirit knife, it blasts through the copper door. After the power collided with the hardware, a deafening roar ensued. The gate was in fragments. At this point, the boy was standing in front of the first major structure in Brentwood, the Deliberation Hall, which was an exclusive space used to discuss state affairs. Although today was not the appointed day for the monthly gathering of civil and military officials, there were nonetheless about a dozen high-ranking officers gathered here, discussing various affairs. The boy could overhear their conversation, and quickly gleaned that they were debating whether the Ville country would send troops to their territory. Further, it seemed they had been discussing the matter among their ranks for the last few weeks, but still, they had not come to a definite conclusion. They seemed anxious about the matter. Episode 585 Eero's Dilemma Within the walls of the Deliberation Hall, the princes and dukes of McGregor State were chatting, discussing their next steps. The leader of the state, Eero McGregor, was sitting on his dragon throne in the center of the hall, looking helplessly at the chatting nobles below. He was anxious because, due to its long decades of peace and prosperity, the McGregor State had become plagued by intrigue once again, and it seemed that infighting was the preferred mode of battle now that there was no distinct external enemy. Of course, this was not an issue unique to the McGregor State, but rather an intractable problem faced by thousands of kingdoms in the Eternal Continent. As he looked at the scene with great worry, Eero's thoughts floated to the Vil country thousands of miles away, for in his view, the political strife in that territory, which had erupted a couple of weeks ago, presented a rare opportunity for the McGregor State the likes of which had not emerged in a millennium at least. Amid the inevitable weakening of the Ville Country, he had sent troops to the capital city of the Ville Country, Morris, to take the city within three days. He assumed that by now the entire Ville Country would belong to the McGregor State, and he thought that if he could absorb the Ville population, it would greatly help his kingdom's resource and population levels. He dreamed of the McGregor State rising even further in the ranks of territories affiliated with the Heavenly Dragon Empire but things had not gone as planned. Indeed, the great Enrique had failed to return, and even more devastatingly, the code for the Four Elephant Array, the treasure of the McGregor family, had been lost on the battlefield, which had forced Eero to give up on his scheme completely. Enrique hadn't explained the reason for his failure in any detail. Rather, he had just asked Eero to cancel any plans for sending more troops, and added that he should prepare for the transfer of one-tenth of the cultivation resources in the McGregor treasury to the Hampton family as compensation. Eero had found the request absurd, of course, and had struggled to accept such a devastating change of fortunes. Under influence of this psychology, Eero had begun to recruit influential people in the royal family to counter Enrique and launch another attack on the Ville country, yet he soon discovered that many of these people were still loyal to the mighty Enrique, so he resolved to scrap this plan, too. And now his thoughts drifted back to the current situation in the Deliberation Hall. He knew that if he didn't intervene soon, 
the conversation between these noblemen and royals would devolve into a useless celebration of the sort of debauchery for which these overindulged men were known. So Eros coughed dramatically to get their attention. Just as they looked up at him, a deafening roar sounded in the direction of the front gates. Eero rushed to the deliberation hall's entrance, where he greeted one of the guards with a solemn expression. Your Majesty, the guard proclaimed, kneeling before Eero, go and find the origin of that ruckus. If it was caused by a commoner, take care of him immediately. Yet if the perpetrator was someone noble, bring him to me, Eero ordered. Yes, Your Grace, the bodyguard shouted. But just as he was about to turn around to check the situation at the front gate, he collided with another guard. Boom! Another loud noise reverberated throughout the compound, and both guards flew twenty feet back. What is the meaning of this? Eero screamed angrily. The guard who had just walked into the hall shook his head and tried to focus his vision. When he had regained his bearings to some extent, he pronounced, A boy of about sixteen or seventeen just broke into the palace and is laying siege to the compound. He has already defeated several guards. What? Someone dares to break into the palace and destroy with abandon? Eero queried in disbelief. He was doubtful of the explanation, as even before the McGregor State's full rise to power when it was still divided among warring factions, the royal palace was a secure place. So the idea of a mere child breaking into it successfully now seemed nothing short of absurd. At the same time, the guard who had just spoken was the head guard of the inner palace and a confidant of the royal family. He would never lie. Eero pointed his finger and ordered, Go to the Eternal Spring Pavilion immediately and notify the energy-transforming warriors. They will take care of the boy. Based on the information he had just been presented, Eero could guess that the person who had broken into the palace had reached the energy-transforming realm at the very least. He thus planned to use his unique power as king to rouse the McGregor family's energy-transforming forces. Ladies and gentlemen, would you like to join me in surveying this odd and shocking situation? Eero continued, now addressing the noblemen and royalty in the hall. A middle-aged man with a strong body and ugly attitude who had reached the great perfection tenth level of the body refining stage was the first to speak. He declared, Okay, better to engage in battle than drink and gamble like we usually do. It will be a nice change of pace. Agreed. We need a break from our debauchery once in a while, chimed in a duke excitedly. After all, it wasn't even noon yet, so even for this crew, it was a bit early to start drinking and gambling. Moreover, it looked like this day was shaping up to be anything but average, so the group was more than willing to take a break from discussing the situation in the Ville country. Meanwhile, at the entrance to the Royal Palace compound, the boy in blue, still with a spirit knife drawn, was walking leisurely around the grounds. Just then, a group of about a dozen guards began to rush toward him. Judging from their cultivation bases, he could tell they would be easy to handle. Oh, brother, he muttered, and then prepared to deploy a beginner fist technique. 